Hello, my name is Dr. Bonnie Key, and I'm the Editor-in-Chief of JAF Cardio-Oncology and the Founders Associate Professor of Cardio-Oncology at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. I am here today with Dr. Ron Wattellis, who serves as an Associate Editor for JAF Cardio-Oncology and is Professor of Medicine and Co-Director of the Stanford Amyloid Center at Stanford University. We are here together today to present to you our bonus October issue dedicated entirely to the important field of amyloidosis. Hi, Ron. Thanks so much for joining me. Hi, Bonnie. It's always great to join you. <laughs> great. So tell our community, what are the three to five main take-home messages that are most important for them to learn from this issue? Well, it's, this is an issue I'm really excited about. There's so much great content in here. I, you know, I'll, I'll try to highlight just a couple of those messages as you asked. So one is that really, whether you're a cardiologist or an oncologist, this is a disease you need to know. Um, it's, uh, it's for an ATCR amyloidosis, it's downright common. Uh, for AL amyloidosis, it's not as common, but you will definitely come across it. And there's so much that we can do for both of these diseases if you make the diagnosis, and particularly if you make the diagnosis early. So there's a lot of really great content in this issue from sort of a how-to perspective, how to evaluate a patient who has a monoclonal gammopathy, uh, um, how to, what's the state of the art therapy for AL amyloidosis, particularly from a hematologist, oncologist perspective? Um, how should we, what's the state of the art for ATCR where so much has been changing? Uh, then important questions like what's the international scene of this disease with important pieces uh, from India, from Brazil, from Denmark? Uh, questions like what can we do for more end stage forms of the disease from a cardiology perspective? Like when should we be thinking about MCS and transplants? And then a really important area that anyone caring for these patients knows comes up all the time, how to approach it from an electrophysiologic standpoint. And uh, we have great content in all of those areas and more. Yeah, thanks so much, Ron, for that perspective. And thank you for all of your great work and making this issue a possibility. Um, I agree, full of a lot of great content. And I know I certainly also learned a lot. Uh, from reading each of the pieces in this issue. Uh, and I wanna thank our authors and reviewers too for making this possible. You know, in reading through all the various pieces uh, that make up this issue, delays in diagnosis was a very prevalent and common theme across the cases, across the reviews, across the original research pieces. And I think to me, it's a critically important barrier for the field to overcome. From your perspective, when should one suspect AL amyloidosis from the cardiologist standpoint and from the oncologist standpoint, when should they be suspecting cardiac involvement? Right. Well, let's, let's start maybe from the oncologist standpoint. And um, in fact, I'm going to take that one step earlier, which is when should the oncologist suspect AL amyloidosis, period. And, you know, oncologists are going to see a lot of patients, particularly if they specialize more on the hematology side, with monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance or smoldering or symptomatic myeloma. And, um, uh, you know, in general, there's not a clear role for, well, when should you really screen? Should you be screening everybody in some uh, way for AL amyloidosis? Uh, what should be the trigger signs? And I would say there's a few uh, important ones uh, from a cardiac standpoint. Clearly, if anybody has monoclonal gammopathy and, and undetermined, with undetermined significance or a myeloma, who then has heart failure, uh, you know, unless it's, for example, known because they've had a huge past infarct or something like that, that deserves a screen. Uh, anybody um, who has one of those diagnoses in a new arrhythmia, that person deserves a screen. But of course, AL amyloidosis can affect so many organs. That's one of the characteristic features of it. So somebody who has proteinuria, somebody who has an unexplained elevation in their alkaline phosphatase, often uh, being liver involved. Involvements, uh, somebody having dysphagia or new constipation. It's such a wide array of symptoms that once it's known that somebody has a monoclonal gammopathy, which is usually going to be when the oncologist is seeing the patient, you have to uh, you have to keep your eyes and ears open for uh, for any of those uh, signs and symptoms. Now, in terms of when they should specifically suspect cardiac involvement. Um, really, every patient with uh, AL amyloidosis should be getting basic biomarker screening with a BNP or NT-proBNP and atroponin. And if those are abnormal, in fact, those are part of the staging systems in AL amyloidosis, that immediately raises a red flag. Really, every patient with AL amyloidosis should also get 
cardiac imaging of some sort, at least an echocardiogram, and should be getting an electrocardiogram as well. And of course, things like lowish voltages uh, should uh, raise red flags. Un unexplained heart block arrhythmias uh, uh, would be all things that would, would raise red flags as well. But I'd say, you know, once you've gotten to the diagnosis of AL amyloidosis, um, then evaluating the heart, that's more commonplace. It's more getting to the disease itself. Now, from a cardiologist's perspective, it's uh, really, really important to remember this disease because AL amyloidosis is a fairly uncommon disease, but my Lord, can you make a huge impact on uh, patient's outcomes if you make the diagnosis quickly. So, uh, and the imaging often will not come out and grab you the same way that an ATCR amyloidosis patient will, who tend to have much thicker hearts that are really the classic ones that you think about that you'll see in presentations. So they may not be that impressive in terms of increased wall thickness. You might see characteristic things like uh, abnormalities on, on uh, strain with sp sparing at the apex, but you might not. Um, so I would say when you see somebody with heart failure that's either clustering with some of those other organ uh, conditions as, as previously described, or for example, somebody with heart failure who just has a persistently positive troponin for no good reason, uh, Q waves that uh, shouldn't be there because they haven't had past infarcts. Um, uh, all of these should, should uh, raise suspicion, even if they don't have that classic, really thick ventricle. Yeah, so well put, Ron. Thank you really so much for those excellent pearls, uh, certainly. And along those lines, in terms of ATTR, when should folks be suspecting ATTR cardiac amyloidosis? And tell us a little bit also again about the workup. Yeah, so ATTR amyloidosis is unlike AL, uh, downright common. Um, it is not a rare disease, just period hard stop. Um, in ATTR amyloidosis in a particularly older population and particularly the older male population, we don't know why it's more common in men than women, but it is. Um, uh, is just is not uncommon. It's downright common. So um, uh, a group of us a few years ago uh, published a piece that was suggesting that we should really be thinking about screening a older population who have thick hearts and heart failure or thick hearts and any other red flag like carpal tunnel syndrome or spinal stenosis, but just heart failure, thick heart, older population, period, deserves a screen. We know how high the uh, rates are, for example, just with concomitant aortic stenosis, not because ATTR amyloidosis causes aortic stenosis, but because you're picking out uh, a patient who is referred for TAVR who have thick hearts, often heart failure, and who tend to be older, older patients, and you screen those patients and you find a lot of it. Uh, so uh, in terms of when to suspect it, the main message I'd get across for ATTR amyloidosis is think broadly. Now, we also know that there's the variant or hereditary form of the disease uh, that in the United States is by far most common with a mutation uh, called V122I or uh, V142I, depending on the nomenclature you're uh, using. And uh, that, uh, that gene mutation is present in about three to three and a half percent of Americans of African descent. And though the penetrance is not that high, it's not that everybody who has the uh, gene mutation goes on to develop the disease, it's a big risk factor. So if you are seeing a patient of African descent, um, also have a higher uh, suspicion from the beginning. There are rare mutations that involve, that can cause neuropathy as well. But again, in the United States, at least, those are quite a, uh, those are quite a bit less uh, common. Now, in terms of the workup, the good news is it's very simple. It is really two or at most three steps. Step one, after you've clinically suspected amyloidosis, is to rule out a monoclonal protein uh, so that you don't miss AL amyloidosis. If you find a monoclonal protein, you must go on to biopsy. And we can debate where to biopsy, whether to start with a fat pad or go straight for an organ like the heart, but you must move on to biopsy. If, however, there is no monoclonal protein, which is most common, that's when you can use bone scintigraphy, which in uh, the United States is technetium pyrophosphate or PYP scans. And when you combine a positive PYP scan with no monoclonal protein, you actually approach 100% specificity in the diagnosis. So it's uh, uh, really quite straightforward. And step three, once you make the diagnosis, is generally it's recommended to uh, do genetic testing to see whether they have the wild type or variant forms. Yeah, great points again, Ron. Thanks so much. And many of the pieces that we feature in this issue speak to those many points that you discussed in terms of genetic screening, in terms of aortic stenosis and amyloid 
concomitant, um, and also about misuse of the PYP scheme as well. Um, and in closing, Ron, tell me from your perspective, what do you think are the greatest needs in the field of amyloidosis? Yeah, thanks, Bonnie. Well, the, the biggest need we, we've already been discussing, but it worth, it's worth repeating, is getting the word out for people to suspect the disease. You know, this was a disease that in the not the too distant past at all was something that people kind of felt like, well, why make the diagnosis? Uh, why even think about it? Because there's nothing you can do. It's a death sentence or you'd hear things like that. Um, thankfully, uh, this is a totally different world now for both forms of the disease. For AL amyloidosis, for most patients now, once the diagnosis is made, we can get adequate control of the light chains, often complete control of the light chains. Um, and uh, if you do that and you, and you institute it before the patient has developed end-stage organ dysfunction, uh, the patients can do very well for a very long time. But if not, particularly if they have cardiac involvement, the disease will progress and often very rapidly. Uh, for ATTR amyloidosis, you know, again, it used to be not <laughs> just a few years ago that we didn't have any treatment. So you'd make the diagnosis and you'd say, well, we can give you diuretics, I guess. You know, there's not a whole lot more we can do. Now we have one approved uh, treatment for cardiac amyloidosis that makes a big difference in outcomes, two approved treatments and, a, and one that's used off-label for the hereditary nerve form of the disease, and a host of clinical trials of agents where there's great hope uh, are going to lead to even better outcomes in the future. So making the diagnosis and, and getting the word out for everybody of who to screen, when to think about it is, is, is I still think, number one. Now, in terms of other, uh, other areas that I'm hoping will uh, evolve over the coming few years, one is uh, the ability to make a definitive imaging-based diagnosis for AL amyloidosis. We cannot do that today, at least uh, not beyond uh, uh, from a stu research study standpoint. And that transformed the field of ATTR amyloidosis once bones and tigger PYP scanning in this country uh, uh, came on the scene. And so to be able to do that nail amyloidosis would be great, not only because it would be more pleasant for the patients, less risky, but because then you could actually start thinking about when should we be using this to, again, get back to that question of screening patients who have known monoclonal gammopathy. So that's something I suspect is going to evolve over the coming years. Uh, for ATTR amyloidosis, I'd love for us to be able to achieve more than slowing disease progression. You know, it's a famitous, the one approved therapy right now. It's wonderful. It's a once a day pill. It makes a big difference in the disease. But not only does it not cure the disease uh, and reverse things, it doesn't stop progression of the disease. It just slows it down. And we can do better, I have a feeling. And I'm really excited for the current clinical trials that are ongoing in the field. Um, and, uh, you know, finally, I'd say, for the patient with particularly AL amyloidosis, but ATTR2, who at diagnosis already have very advanced disease, how should we best care for them? What is the right role for things like transplant? Uh, what is the right role for things like um, uh, defibrillators? Um, uh, right now, there is uh, a lot of opinions. <laughs> There's a few case series but no good evidence. And uh, we've already seen in, in national databases, for example, that uh, the rates of transplants for amyloidosis have quadrupled uh, just in the last few years. Um, at what point sh should that keep going up? Is there some point that we reach where we say, now this is, shouldn't go above this or we're gonna be transplanting patients, it doesn't make sense. I think that's gonna be evolving more in the coming years as well. Thanks so much, Ron. Really excellent points. And the focus on therapies, I agree, a lot of excitement and a lot of new therapies are happening. And these are really well detailed in the two state-of-the-art reviews that we have. I also think making the therapies accessible. There's a lot of notion about the really, really high cost of many of these, and they need to be accessible to the patients. You know, thanks for pointing that out, Bonnie. I, I should have mentioned that. Uh, it's so true. Um, uh, for ATTR amyloidosis in particular, because it is, again, the much more common disease, uh, right now, the uh, one approved therapy in the United States costs over $200,000 a year for a once-a-day pill that uh, does not cost much at all to produce. 
um, that again is priced as if you're, uh, you're talking about a super rare disease. Uh, this is not a super rare disease. It cannot stay at that. Um, and uh, we'll see, will we'll competition if new uh, therapies come in uh, lower the price uh, or will just an, enough pressure from advocacy and other groups help, help lower the price? Because it can't stay like this. And if new therapies are approved and we now start talking about combining some of the therapies, silencer and stabilizer therapies, for example, and now we're talking about doubling or tripling that cost for patients who, who can and hopefully will reliably live for many years with the disease, you know, again, that's not sustainable and that needs to be addressed. Absolutely. Thanks again, Ron. Thanks so much for joining me today and for all of your great work with this issue. I want to thank our community as well for all of your contributions and support and hope you enjoy this issue as much as we do too. Thank you. Thanks. It was so much fun putting together and it was great working with you and the team. Thanks.